the Second Corinthians five and a little bit of Second Corinthians chapter six, and um, particularly as we partake of the emblems, um, what do those emblems mean to us? Well, if I was to, for myself anyway, to sum up the emblems in a single verse and what they mean to me, it would be Matthew chapter twenty and verse twenty-eight, where Jesus said. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, or to be served, but to minister, to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And to me, brothers and sisters, that really speaks volumes of what the emblems are all about. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. His whole life epitomised selflessness, self-sacrifice and service for others. And all through his life, we see him in the gospel records giving and giving and giving. And finally, that culminated in his death on the cross. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We read passages such as Mark 6 and verse 31, where he and his disciples were so busy healing and teaching and helping others that Mark records many were coming and going and they had no leisure, no, not so much as to eat. They were so busy serving other people they couldn't even sit down and have a meal. And that to me, brothers and sisters, really epitomises what the emblems are all about. It's about service, it's about giving. And on the night he was betrayed, he said, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Not just a statement of fact, eating this Passover with you. He was saying, I've decided to do this for your benefit. It was not just with you, it was for you and for your benefit. And to me, brothers and sisters, that really epitomises the life of our Lord and what that entails upon us in our own discipleship in Christ and our life in Christ. It's about giving. Um, Let's just have a look because that is exactly what epitomised the Apostle Paul. Let's just go back to chapter 4. We really skimmed through chapter 4 quickly yesterday. Um, I had to dropped off bits that I wanted to mention. But let's just have a look at verse 14 to 15. You remember the Apostle Paul said in verse 1, We faint not. And again in verse 16, For this cause we faint not. All these difficulties and trials that came upon him, verse 8, we're troubled on every side, not distressed, we are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, etc. And he says we still don't faint because he believed fully in the resurrection. Verse 14, knowing, we're absolutely confident, he says, that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and present us with you. Paul never looked at his own salvation in isolation. He never looked at his own salvation in isolation, like he was running a race and he was there in it for himself to get the prize for himself. Paul never looked at it that way. Of course he wanted to be in the kingdom. Of course he wanted to uh, uh, receive the salvation through the grace of God and to be there in the kingdom with his Lord. But it was never in isolation. We believe that God who raised up Jesus shall raise up us also and shall present us with you. He says, I'm running a race like we saw yesterday in the Isthmian Games. I'm running for the crown. What was that crown, brothers and sisters? Was Paul interested in just saving himself? What was the crown our Lord Jesus Christ ran the race for? Was it just about saving himself? Paul said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19, What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? And you know the words very well. You can probably repeat them. Is it not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? You are our crown of rejoicing. I'm running this race not just to stand on the podium and get a gold medal and a crown for myself. I'm running it for you. 
He never saw his salvation in isolation, neither did our Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he says in verse 15. All things are for your sakes. All this suffering, persecuted, cast down, troubled on every side, afflicted, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord, this is all for your sakes. I'm going through this for you. You accuse me of commending myself and seeking a following and trumpeting my own virtues. I'm doing all of this for you, he says. And that's why Corinthians is full of catalogues of all the things that Paul suffered. He wasn't glamorising his sufferings in any way. He was saying, this is the reality of it. I'm going through this for you and for your benefit. You know, sometimes we suffer, brothers and sisters, and we go through various circumstances, and we sometimes think to ourselves, okay, what is God trying to teach me? And that's true. Sometimes God may be trying to teach us something through those afflictions. But we should also ask ourselves the question, what is God trying to teach others through me? Is there any way that what I'm going through in my life might be benefiting somebody else. And that's how Paul viewed it. And we'll see he's actually quoting that from the Old Testament. We'll see in one of our later studies. All things are for your sakes. When Jesus laid down his life in that beautiful prayer in John chapter 17 on the night, he was in the upper room with his disciples. He said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, but Jesus never looked at his own salvation in isolation, did he? For their sakes, I sanctify myself. And so it was with the Apostle Paul. It was a life of selfless giving. Now, what else inspired the Apostle Paul to go through these sufferings and to say, we faint not? He was working on their behalf he was bringing the light of the gospel in chapter 4, verse 6 to others to enlighten them with the glory of God. That's how Paul viewed his work in the Ecclesia. Chapter 4, verse 6, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That's a quote from Numbers 14, verse 21, and Habakkuk 2, verse 14, and Isaiah 11 and Psalm 72. There's four Old Testament passages where those words are taken from. Paul saw his work in the Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, to, to, to forward the purpose of God, to bring the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to you. Whenever we see our work in the Ecclesia as a bit of a drag and whenever ecclesial life becomes a little bit ho-hum and repetitive and perhaps boring, we may even be tempted to think, always reframe ecclesial life in the wider context, that what we're doing now is preparing one another and preparing ourselves and preparing our young people and our kids for eternity. You remember in the days of Haggai and Zerubbabel and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and Zechariah, the prophet, they looked at the temple they built and they were all so depressed because it was in their eyes as of nothing, it says in the book of Ezra. They looked at their work in the truth and they were so downcast because it was like they were working on nothing. And the message of Haggai and Zechariah was, despise not the day of small things. What you're doing now is preparing the way for something much, much greater. That's how we should reframe ecclesial life when things maybe start to get a bit repetitive or a little bit ho-hum and you get a little bit too much into the, into the routine Let's look at ecclesial life that's why, that way. That's why Paul says, we faint not. That's our work. Reframing ecclesial life in that way gave him a breath of fresh air to be able to carry on that work and suffer for others. Why else would Paul say, we faint not? He was confident in the resurrection, we know. And also in chapter 5 and verse 14, which we just read, the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. 
I'd just like you to think on those words for a moment, brothers and sisters, because this was the driving force in the Apostle Paul's life. We read in the Acts of the Apostles of men who hazarded their lives for the gospel. We read of Paul saying, I'm not, I'm not only ready to be bound, but also to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Why was it that he could have such confidence and such gritty determination to give his own life up for the sake of the gospel? Yes, he believed he'd be raised, but it was this driving power in his life. The love of Christ constrains us, he says. Now that word, I don't know if you've got another version uh, that you're using, but that word in the King James Version constrains us. I'll read you what that word is translated as and what other versions give it as, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what Paul is saying here. The love of Christ constrains us. It compels us. It controls us. It holds us in, urges us forward, impels us, has hold of us. That's how other versions put it. That's what the Greek says, and that's how it's translated elsewhere. That's just a mixture, if you like, of various ways. But you get the idea. This is a power, Paul says, that has absolute hold of us and bears us along and impels us. Just go back to Hosea chapter 11. This gives us a sense of what Paul is saying. The love of Christ, can, why can we die daily? Why are we not afraid to give our lives for the sake of the gospel? And we faint not. It's because the love of Christ impels us. Hosea chapter 11, God is talking about his own child, Israel. When Israel was a child, verse 1, I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Verse 3, I taught Ephraim, Israel, the northern kingdom, also to walk, taking them by the arms, but they knew not that I healed them. Now here's Ephraim, the ox. God says, I took my son out of Egypt because I loved him, and I taught him how to walk, taking him by the arms. You get a beautiful picture there, don't we, brothers and sisters, of a little toddler Staying with Cam and Suzanne at the moment, and they've got a little toddler, Ezra, 10 months old, 9 months old. And you can imagine a little 9 to 10 month old baby as you're teaching them how to walk. You take them by the arms and you sort of stand over them carefully as they step out. And God's saying, that's what I did to Israel. I took him by the arms and taught him how to walk. Verse 4. I'd like you to just think about these words. Ephraim the ox. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. <coughs> I was unto them as they that take off the yoke. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I took that yoke off them, God says. I drew them. God doesn't force us to do anything. He can't, well, he can, but he doesn't force us to do anything. His love and the love of his son constrains us. It has hold of us. He appeals to us. As Hosea says here, he draws us. Now Jesus used those words, didn't he? If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. John chapter 12. This he spake, signifying what death he should die. There's something magnetic and powerful about the cross of Christ. And Paul wrote about the cross of Christ on many occasions. Let's have a look at Galatians chapter 2. God draws us to him. No man can come to the Father. Or no, one, no man can come to me except the Father draw him, Jesus said. Galatians chapter 2. Paul the Apostle. Previously Saul the Pharisee, it's hard to imagine that he didn't witness 
the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no proof either way, but the who's who of Jerusalem would have been present at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine Saul the Pharisee, who grew up at the feet of Gamaliel, wasn't there. What we do know, brothers and sisters, is that Paul often writes of the scene of the cross with such vivid imagery and word pictures that he presents such a powerful picture to us. So he may well have been there present and would have seen what Jesus went through. Now look what he says as he's reflecting on his past life as a Pharisee and his new life in Christ. Verse 19 of Galatians chapter 2. I, that's ego, the Greek word, my ego through the law is dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not my ego, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul often speaks about the love of God towards us, the love of Christ towards us. Here it gets very, very personal. He loved me and he gave himself for me. That's personalising what the truth means. Like Brother Max said earlier, that's the journey from head to heart. That's making it personal and internalising the message for ourselves. He loved me and he gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ, verse 20. As a Pharisee, he may well have been one of that crowd that was mocking and jeering and shooting out the lip saying he trusted in God, let him deliver him and so on. That awful scene around the cross. Paul may well have been among that crowd. If he wasn't physically, certainly in spirit, he was among that crowd. Paul says now, I'm stripped bare and naked and I'm up there on the cross with him, sharing his shame, the stigmata, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he bore in his own body, he says in Galatians. I'm up there with him. Why am I there with him? Because I'm living now a new life empowered by his faith and his love for me. He's made it very, very personal indeed, as we all ought to, brothers and sisters. Now, John says, Hereby we know the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. What was John saying by that? First John 5, verses 1 to 3. What did he mean by that? We know the love of God if we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. John was saying, brothers and sisters, with love, nothing is too hard. Our discipleship takes on a whole new plane when inspired by love. And John was quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 30, which we won't look at now. It's not too hard, Moses said, if the word's in your heart. It's not too hard, you can do it. That was the message of Moses in Deuteronomy 30. His commandments are not grievous if we love him. It's the same with anything in life, isn't it? If we love our jobs, it's nothing to bound out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning and jump on the bus or, or do whatever we've got to do. If we love our, our spouse, our husband, our wife, it's nothing to get up in the morning and to go get him or her a coffee or make him breakfast or whatever. When things are inspired by love, nothing's too hard. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what John was saying. And that's what Paul is saying. The love of Christ constrains us. It builds us up, it lifts us up and elevates our life in Christ, our discipleship to a whole new level. And that's what we need to contemplate this morning as we think about the bread and the wine, as we eat bread and drink wine. 
It's that love, brothers and sisters, that touches our hearts and writes that new covenant in our heart, as Paul said earlier in chapter 3. Think about the uh, slave in Jeremy 15. Let's just have a quick look at it. Jeremy chapter 15. We've sort of gone a couple of times into the book of Deuteronomy this weekend. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, Deuteronomy is all about the spirit of the law, the spirit of faith. Paul said in Romans 10, Moses was preaching the word of faith, which we preach. Moses wasn't talking about law. Jeremy 15, we read about the slave, verse 12. If thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. Um, you shall furnish him liberally, in verse 14. And remember, in verse 15, you were a bondman in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh, your God, redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing this day. Now, notice verse 16. This is the slave that's allowed to go free. It shall be, verse 16, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee because he loves you and your house because he is well with you. You shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear under the door and he shall be your servant forever. So he was free to go at the end of seven years and the record in Deuteronomy says, if he loves you, his master and his master's house, and says he wants to serve, you'll make him your servant forever. What does that remind you of, brothers and sisters? We've all been redeemed from sin. That's what the parable is about. Israel was redeemed from the house of bondage in Egypt, and they are made to be God's servant. We've been redeemed from sin, as Paul says in Romans 6. We now have a new master. If we love him and his house, the two greatest commandments of the law, Love Yahweh your God with all your heart, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. If he loves you and your house and chooses to serve you, he shall serve you forever. And his ear would be dicked through with an awl. Now Paul uses this idea in Galatians chapter 5, doesn't he? Verse 13. Brethren, you've been called to freedom, to liberty. Like that slave was offered liberty. You've been called to liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love be slaves, doulos, serve, be slaves one to another. By love be slaves one to another. Because we love him and we love his house, the ecclesia. And that's what inspires this new life in Christ. That's what inspires us to rise above law thinking, legalism, which could never inspire that. That's what God wants to see in us. The love of Christ constrains us. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge if one died for all, then we're all dead. He was our representative, of course, not a substitute. He died on behalf of us all. He represented the human race. And we say, brothers and sisters, he died to show what was due to sin and to declare the righteousness of God. And that, that's exactly right. That's what was due to sin. He was showing the righteousness of God in dying on the cross. But he was also showing us how to live. He was showing us, brothers and sisters, that we need to be dead to self. Dead to sin, dead to our own selfish interests and to our own agenda. And verse 15, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Our Lord Jesus Christ showed us a better way. He showed us the way of service. We no longer live to ourselves, we live to him. And when we live to him, we live to one another. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, Jesus said, that you do to me. 
That's how we live to him. It's by active service to his brethren and sisters, the ecclesia. You know, brothers and sisters, we talk about fellowship. We talk about breaking bread, drinking wine as a symbol of our fellowship. And of course, our fellowship is based on the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. We read in the book of Acts. It's based on a common set of beliefs and a common mindset and unity on all those things. But this idea of fellowship in the bread and wine goes beyond that. Barclay says in his book on New Testament words, the word koinonia, which is the common word in the New Testament for fellowship, refers to, and I quote, the spirit of generous sharing as opposed to selfish getting. That's what fellowship means. It refers to a partaking, a participation together. That's what the emblems are all about. It's a sharing of fellowship. It's an association together, but it goes beyond that into the practical practicalities, if you like, of ecclesial life. It's partaking, participating together, being involved together, working together, being engaged with one another and what's going on with one another in one another's lives. That's fellowship. It's not purely some sort of academic association. It is, of course, a fellowship based on doctrinal truth and on common ideals and values, but it goes beyond that. Participating, partaking together, the spirit of generous sharing as opposed to selfish getting, and that's what the Lord's life epitomised in his selfless giving for our benefit. He goes on to say... In verse 17 of chapter 5, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A new creature. Remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Fornicators, idolaters, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, etc., etc. Such were some of you. Paul says here, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are new. Do we really believe that? That God has wiped the slate clean. That we've been made white in the blood of the Lamb. That our past failings and sins and the things which cause us so often to spiral down, especially on a Sunday morning when we come to break the bread and drink the wine together, do we really believe God has taken those and cast them into the depths of the sea, as Micah says? All things are become new. All things are passed away. That's a quotation from Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19 where Isaiah the prophet talks about these unclean beasts of the field giving glory and praise to God. Beasts are spoken of as mankind in his absolute ugliness. Beasts with all their despicable habits. Animals. And God says, the beasts of the field will give glory to me. In Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, where Paul gets these words from. Corinth, the cesspool of sin and immorality, called now, chosen, faithful, washed and clean. Verse 18, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That word reconcile, brothers and sisters, it's quite a simple word, but a very, very powerful one. It simply means the restoration of a friendship where enemies or an enemy is now brought close to be a friend. And let's just turn over a couple of pages to Colossians very quickly, just to give you a sense of how it's used in the New Testament. And you can look at Romans 5, verses 8 to 10 in your own time. But Colossians chapter 1. 
Verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in heaven or of earth, uh, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he has now reconciled. So it's going from being an enemy to a friend. God has reconciled the world to himself. He has reconciled, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Now those words are huge, aren't they? You were enemies by wicked works in your mind, and now you've been reconciled. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Do we really see our standing before God in those words? I sometimes struggle with those words. I don't think I'm unblameable or unreprovable. But I've got to think, hang on, if you're in Christ and you're really in Christ, that's how God views us. He's accepted us in the beloved, Paul wrote to Ephesus. We're accepted in him and we're clean and justified in him, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this word reconcile, brothers and sisters, doesn't just refer to a change of relationship, going from being an enemy to a friend. Of course, it does refer to that. But Bullinger, in his exposition of the Greek language in his book, which some of you may have heard of, he tells us this about this word reconciled. And I quote you again. He says, this word means so to act that the opposite party may lay aside his enmity. So it's not just the final result of going from being an enemy to a friend. The use of the Greek word in classical Greek and also in the Bible and the context in which it's used, Bullinger says it's to act in such a way so as to make the opposing party lay aside their enmity. Now think about that in the context of the emblems this morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of wicked men, a brutal, shameful, criminal's death. And God allowed that to happen on a hilltop in full view of the public, despising the shame of the cross, Paul says. God acted in such a way so as to cause mankind, and those who would respond, to lay aside their opposition and their enmity and to come back to him. If I be lifted up from the earth, Jesus said, I will draw all men to him. If that doesn't touch our heart, brothers and sisters, and, and touch our emotions, what will? We really need to stop and think about it, don't we? God has acted in such a way so as to cause those who oppose him, mankind in general, to lay aside their enmity. And that's the essence of reconciliation. Going from being an enemy to a friend, but how we bring about that situation. Hold that thought. Matthew chapter 5, very quickly, let's have a look at it. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus, all through the Sermon on the Mount, is talking about how we can mimic the Father. Love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Act like God is the message all through Matthew chapter 5. Verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother. Now, Jesus didn't say, if you've got a problem with your brother, go and fix it up. He said, if your brother has a problem with you, the onus is on you and me. 
to be reconciled to our brother. That turns things around on its head, doesn't it? The world had a problem with God. God didn't sit back and wait for the world to come begging. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God initiated the process. He had to. He had to act in such a way so as to cause the opposing party, us, to lay down our arms of opposition and our enmity, to lay it all aside and to come back to him, to be drawn back to him. God had to initiate that. In our own lives in the Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, if a brother has got a problem with us, we can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. We have got to go out of our way and do what we can to be the healer of the breach, as the prophets say, to initiate the process of reconciliation, to do what we can to act in such a way as to cause our brother to come back to us, to, to fix that relationship. Because that's how God acted through our Lord Jesus Christ and he wants us to imitate him as dear children. He set, God has set the pattern and the example and he wants us to follow that. Let's quickly go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 19 and 20. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. The world, what does that word conjure up in our minds? What did it conjure up in the mind of the Corinthians? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. God was reconciling that world back to himself. God didn't need reconciling to the world. God doesn't budge. He was reconciling that world with all its abominable practices back to himself and acting in a way so as to cause them to lay down their opposition. Verse 20. Now then, Paul says, we, the apostles, are ambassadors for Christ as though God did exhort you, comfort you. That's the paraclesis word. To call along one side. As God did exhort you by us, we beg you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador do? What's the idea behind that word? It means, brothers and sisters, it's someone who acts on behalf of a king to go out and broker a deal. That's what ambassadors do. They go out and they broker a deal. You remember the parable of Jesus, a king with 10,000 men going to war with a king with 20,000 men. He sits down and he counts the cost and he sends an ambassador to seek terms of peace. It's the king in the weaker position with 10,000 men that sends out the ambassador. God is in the stronger position. He's in the stronger position. And yet, Paul says, he's beseeching you by us and we're begging you, be reconciled to him. We won't look at it now, but Isaiah 27, verses 4 to 6. So we're out of time. Isaiah 27, verses 4 to 6. God says, it's within my rights to burn up all those who rebel against me. It's within my rights to do that. But I'd rather they take hold of my strength and seek peace with me. Beautiful passage. And this is the way the iniquity of Jacob shall be purged, he said. I want them to take hold of my strength, Lord Jesus Christ, the man of my right hand who's made strong for me. Take hold of my strength and make peace with me, Isaiah said, and he will make peace with me. Now let's just quickly look and in conclusion at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6. We're not going to look at this whole chapter, just one thought. He goes through all his sufferings, brothers and sisters, in verse 4, patience, afflictions, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labours. Uh, verse 8, by honour and dishonour, evil report. This is all the slander that was coming on Paul. As unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Why is Paul enumerating these sufferings again? 
Well, look what he says, brothers and sisters, in verses 11 to 13. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Be not straightened in us. Uh, ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Now, if you're like me, when I read that, I think, what is that saying? All we've got to do is look at another translation. This is what the NLT says in verses 11 to 13. And I encourage you to just look at the words in your Bible and I'll read the NLT to you. This is what Paul says. Now remember, brothers and sisters, Paul's relationship with the Corinthians was on tender hooks, on a knife's edge, because all the poisoning and the agitation that was going on in the background. Paul says, God is begging you to come back to him. And he's begging the world to come back to him. And he's acted in such a way so as to bring people back and draw them back to him. Paul says, I've gone through all these sufferings in verses 4 to 8. Now look at what he says in verses 11 to 13. The NLT says, We have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part. But you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you are my own children. Open your hearts to us. Paul is going through exactly the same experience that God goes through. Our hearts are open to you. There's no lack of love on my part, Paul says. I'm begging you, open your heart to us. God acted in such a way, brothers and sisters, as to bring people back to him. Paul has gone through all this suffering and tells the Corinthians about it, not trying to glamorise his sufferings or anything like that. He tells the Corinthians what he suffered and he's saying, I'm begging you, come back to me. I'll do whatever it takes to restore our relationship. He said in chapter 12, I will gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more I love you, the less I be loved. He was going through exactly the same experience the Father goes through. How can we know God, brothers and sisters? We often talk about knowing God. This is life eternal to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. How can we know God? It's not just head knowledge, it's acting like Him. It's doing what he would do. It's putting ourselves, so to speak, excuse the expression, in his shoes and really appreciating what it has taken on God's part to extend that mercy and that forgiveness and that love to us. And God is grieved with sin. Ezekiel says in his sixth chapter, when my people sin against me, I am broken, shattered, that's how God speaks about sin. I'm shattered. And yet he still extends the hand of love and forgiveness to all of us and begs us to be reconciled back to him. When we, brothers and sisters, extend mercy and forgiveness and do what we can to draw others to us in broken relationships, it's only then, despite the pain and the hurt of that process, it's only then that we really begin to appreciate and to know the love of our Father towards us.